fellow members of IIC, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the D.S. Borka Memorial Foundation and India International Center, welcome to the annual seminar on keys to governance. The, po the topic for 2024 is keys to governance, free, pluralistic and independent media. We have a distinguished panel of speakers today, Bharat Bhushan, South Asia Editor 360 Info. He is also the convener of the IIC Sectoral Group on Media. Rakesh Bhattabhyal, Associate Professor, Center for Media Studies, JNU. N.R. Mohanty, Senior Journalist. Bhasha Singh, Senior Journalist and Writer, will be joining us uh, shortly. She had to cover some uh, event uh, which has just happened or is happening. So she's got a little head up. And yours truly, Suhas Borkar, shall moderate the discussion. I acknowledge the presence of our IIC director, Sri Srivastava. Thank you very much. Uh, for some housekeeping, uh, the discussion is for 90 minutes. Each speaker gets 15 minutes, which takes us past 7. After that, we open the discussion to a Q&A session. At the end, each panelist gets two minutes for concluding remarks. We close by 7.30. This is the ninth edition of the seminars on keys to governance in honor of my elder brother, Shekhar Borka, banana boy on the Indian postage stamp, private sector administrator, citizen environmentalist, advocate of empowerment of persons with disabilities, and who was a senior member of IIC and who passed away in 2015. The earlier eight Seminars in the series Keys to Governance were on Compliance and Delivery 2016, Political Will 2017, Constitution as Ideology 2018, Education as Empowerment 2019, Steel Frame 2020, Independence of Judiciary 2021, Constitutional Morality 2022, Social and Communal Harmony 2023. For two years, due to the COVID pandemic, we were on webinar mode, but last year we resumed the physical meeting with a technological ad on that. We were webcasting this meeting live on the ICC, IIC YouTube channel, IIC programs, where it shall also be archived to be viewed anytime on call. This year also, we are webcasting the seminar live. Now we shall request uh, the speakers to, to light the lamp. We now uh, 
present Angabastrams to our speakers. These Angabastrams come from artisans in Salem in Tamil Nadu and they are called Ganga Jamana. They represent our pluralistic tradition. Can I request uh, Sudha come and uh, Shira Bhavi, please come. When Bhasha comes, I think we can do the honors then. Uh, now to uh, today's topic, keys to governance, free, pluralistic, and independent media. On the one hand, we have the ideal role of media in a democracy as a watchdog, the fourth pillar of democracy, an informed and aware citizenry through media, as a civic forum, and the question of accountability, an agenda setter, and then we also have cross-media restrictions. This is the ideal situation. And what do we have? And as a part of that ideal situation, there is an enlightened public service broadcaster. On the other hand, the actual reality of the media today, no watchdog but lapdog, reminders of the 1975 emergency, manipulation, self-censorship, Polarization, threats are a new normal, TV studios have become courts and anchors have become judges. There is a false narrative, dissent and criticism is curbed, fake news and goblician tweets are rampant. And day-to-day -day trials and tribulations of an independent journalist can be hair-raising. A question arises, given the political economy of the Indian media, does it not have an inbuilt prejudice towards the marginalized communities? And given the power of the media, is not social harmony an utopian concept? I would request uh, Bharat Bhushan to take the floor. Bharat. Uh, thank you, Suhas. Uh, as Suhas uh, so succinctly listed uh, the three different ways in which the media can promote good governance, uh, I can only repeat them and then elaborate on them. He said that the media can promote good governance by being a watchdog. It can do so by providing uh, a public platform facilitating debate on major issues of governance, so a civic forum. And three, by setting social and economical, economic agenda by raising red flags and alerts about citizens' concerns. So in that sense, an agenda setter, a provider of uh, feedback, technically negative feedback, so that the state uh, can correct its governance. So let me take these issues individually and examine whether the Indian media is fulfilling uh, this role. And if not, how close or how distant it is from this ideal role. So let's take the media's watchdog role. In its watchdog role, media can aid good governance by promoting transparency, accountability, and public scrutiny of government policy, its governance. In its watchdog role, the media also provides a counter to the propaganda narrative of the state and its various institutions, the executive, the judiciary, the legislature, and also of the corporate world and what else is happening in society. Basically, media provides an external scrutiny, an outside eye, and criti provides critical examination of policies, decisions, and functioning of our social, political, and economic institutions. How does it do it? It, 
does so by uh, pointing out maladministration, policy failure, corruption, nepotism, favoritism, scandals, whether they be in judiciary or in parliament or in the executive or in the corporate world. The question then is, is this happening in India? And if so, qualitatively, to what extent is it happening? If you look at the Indian media today, you'll find that there's very little reporting of misuse of public office, very little reporting of malfeasance, very little or no reporting of financial scandals. There are a few honorable exceptions, of course, but they remain marginal. By and large, the Indian media has lost both its bark and its bite. Why has this happened, one might ask? There are several reasons. One, I think the state today has been successful in deterring uh, criticism, preventing criticism. Does it do so by dictating to editors? I don't think so. It may happen in extreme cases. But if about 45% of your revenue comes from government advertisements, then that itself is a deterrence from going out on a limb to show a mirror to the state. Study the budgets, ad budgets of even the Delhi government or the central government, the full page ads that come in newspapers. They're a source of revenue, they keep the media going. The moment those ads are withdrawn, financially you're, you become precarious. I remember running a newspaper mail today for the India Today group. Sheila Dixit's government for four and a half years that I was there did not give a single ad to us because her uh, criticism was that why are you critical of my government? Why do you keep on saying Sheila's government cannot maintain roads or cannot do this or that, etc. Mail today collapsed <laughs> largely not because of Sheila Dixit, I must say, but because ads were not forthcoming to support critical journalism. This has also happened because the state owns the main new, uh, news channels, which are free. That is radio news, free to air uh, Doordarshan channels, and there are quite a few of them. They set the agenda in rural areas where the people are not uh, going to pay for dish TV always. It also happens because the state and the executive denies access or limits access of the media uh, practitioners to institutions of governance. Today, you can't go into government offices. You cannot, media cannot report on parliament. They've introduced a pool system. Some people are allowed to go, and the rest of them report from agency copy. You cannot enter defense establishments. Your movements are monitored. Uh, each time you go, a picture is taken, and your other number is recorded, and then they know each time you're going into any government office, who's gone in, who has he met, etc. This also happens by imposing censorship on, go on government functionaries. Earlier, with a PIB card, you could go into government offices and talk to people. You didn't have, you could specify, I'm going to meet X and meet 10 other people. Now you cannot. If government officials uh, talk to the media, their jobs are in danger. So this is preventing freedom of speech of government functionaries, those who may have some critical views on governance. So those views never get reflected in the media. This also happens by bringing in legal restrictions on freedom of the media. Stricter regulatory mechanisms and laws, we've seen several laws are coming in now, including the latest, the Broadcast Regulatory Authority Bill. Filing of FIRs against reporters is a new tendency. Each time a report is disliked by a state or a government department, they file a FIR against the journalist. This, we've seen this happen in the case of Manipur. Uh, charging journalists with heinous crimes like sedition, uh, terrorism, Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, and entangling them in police and legal processes. And this also happens because concentration of ownership and actively promoting takeover of the media by friendly corporates by the government. Now, I don't want to go into details of which corporates are taking over which media. You, you're well aware of uh, their names. And, but I would like to talk about what corporatization uh, of the media does. It leads to concentration of ownership and consolidation and aggregation of media ownership. And it reduces pluralism in the media and it homogenizes the media discourse. If the same man owns a news agency, a TV channel, uh, a financial news site, a political news site, and God alone knows uh, uh, what his appetite is, then you can imagine how 
homogenization takes place, reducing uh, pluralism and diversity. So all these factors together have muted, if not eliminated, the watchdog role of the media in India. The second thing was media as a civic forum. So media is part of what one might call the public sphere. And in that public sphere, the media can in principle and should in principle mediate between citizens and the state by facilitating debate about major issues, critically examining the political leadership of the day, compare and evaluate competitive positions of political parties, especially in the run-up to elections. And if the media is pluralistic, it can reflect the different social, cultural, and even religious pluralism of society by reflecting, writing about, and discussing, and debating the multiple and differing voices in society. Again, I ask whether the Indian media is fulfilling its role as a pluralistic civic forum. What we are witnessing in India is a clear strategy to silence the critical press. This is being done through the following means. One, by manipulating the media market and changing its landscape. As I said, engineering the takeover of independent media. You've seen how independent media has been taken over by friendly corporates. Two, by constructing a pro-government media empire, by delegitimizing critics and critical journalists, setting the police after them, dubbing them anti-national, putting Pegasus uh, uh, spyware into their phones, uh, claiming that they're receiving money from abroad, etc. Another reason why the media cannot perform its role as a civic forum well in India is because increasingly it is divided, not in terms of pro-government or anti-government media, but along ideological lines. Anti-government or critical media is immediately dubbed anti-India, foreign agents, or traitors. And they are subdued, actively subdued, not necessarily by the state, but by their uh, uh, competitors in the media itself. Uh, but how does the government do it? It does it, as I said, by misuse of government machinery, police, intelligence bureau, judicial processes. It does it by abusing public resources, by giving it to total right-wing rags or ideologically suitable rags, giving them ads and denying it to independent media. It does so by harassing private advertisers who support such media ventures, while government shovels vast sums of taxpayer money into pro-government mouthpieces. It also does so by denying access to publicly held information excluding independent and critical journalists from official events and actually hindering communication with public officials. And this is not happening only to journalists who write. It's happening to photojournalists. I was in Lucknow recently and I was shocked to find that every minister in UP, including the chief minister, carries uh, with him or her a retinue of their own photographers. Photojournalists uh, of newspapers are not allowed anywhere near. They said, don't worry, pictures will reach your office. So everybody's got his own writer, everybody's got his own photographer. So what is the result of all this? One, readers and viewers who do not actively look for alternative, source, alternative sources of news, and these sources are mostly online, are served a virtually exclusive government narr narrative. Critical public discourse is blunted by dominant pro-government narrative on TV, radio, and print, and social media. The majority of the country's population is left in the dark about any alternative point of view. If, there's, if the Prime Minister goes to Ayodhya, it's Ayodhya, Ayodhya, Ayodhya on every TV channel and every newspaper. If he goes to Lakshadweep, it's all about Lakshadweep, Lakshadweep, Lakshadweep. Maldives is bad, Maldives is bad. This, everybody would have the same prime time programs. Journalistic investigation is prevented or critical views are ignored by the state. They don't care. There's also a deluge of misinformation. Now, you would say misinformation only misleads people. It does that, but it also does something else. It diverts good talent, media talent, from what they ought to be doing, that is reporting and analyzing things, to devoting their time to fact-checking and countering misinformation. So some of the best journalists are today fact-checkers, and those who are checking misinformation, but actually they ought to be reporting and analyzing things. And fifth. They create financial stress, job loss, 
self censorship and bureaucratic harassment of independent journalists which deeply damages independent media the third role of uh, media as an agenda setter uh, the question is how does or how can the media set the agenda of governance so we're talking of the ideal uh, role of media as an agenda setter is by flagging social problems by channelizing citizens concerns to the government directly and when the media does so it overcomes the failure of internal communication between government agencies between the center and the state and this is especially so in the case of natural disasters outbreak of diseases famines food shortages etc because by the time official channels uh, transmit this information to the center often it's too late so media plays that superb role of alerting the government saying look this is what is going wrong and you must act so this helps speed up the response of the government to the problems that the media flags i mean tomes have been written about uh, how famines can be can be prevented by uh, the media free media so reporters in effect become uh, an efficient channel of communication between the affected citizens and the government once again one might ask is the indian media playing its agenda setting role effectively i would suggest that instead of being a public service the media in india even when privately owned has deformed into virtually state media its news news coverage is not balanced the viewpoint of the opposition politicians is either absent muted or presented in a negative light and that is why for example i'm not justifying uh, what the congress party is doing but they said they did the bharat jodo yatra and the new yatra because nobody carries their point of view to the public effectively so they would much rather do it themselves they don't trust the media to do it for them the media owners and editors have become stakeholders and promoters of the dominant discourse of the state on the economy on society and social vision so swas was saying that the marginalized people are left out if everybody shares the uh, a new liberal economic point of view then where is the space in a newspaper where the editor promotes that view where the owner promotes that view for anybody to write about the marginalized or their point of view so in this manner the space for multiplicity of voices opinions and analysis is gradually shrinking in the indian media so the media but does the media set an agenda today my answer is yes the media does set the agenda today but it does so for the state it sets it promotes the state's agenda Uh, by willingly becoming the amplifier of the agenda of the state and the political party that controls the executive and i gave you examples so you only have to watch tv news and see the front pages of newspapers every day same ads same news But think about it is there a correlation the indian media today does little to promote democracy or good governance it does nothing to make the government accountable or responsive to citizens needs so i think a free press matters both intrinsically in a democracy and also instrumentally that's why the topic of you know how does a pluralistic and free media aid good governance so it has those two roles however we, what we are witnessing today is a gradual gradual erosion of that ideal role of the media thank you uh, thank you bharat i think you have given a uh, uh, what should i say a fantastic overview of what's happening what the ideal situation is and how we are uh, i mean there's a kind of a um, to use a cliche um, this is this manufacturing of consent so now i request uh, uh, rakesh patpal to take the floor good evening uh after bharat uh, has set up the template to what we are witnessing today in the larger landscape of uh, landscape of media uh, one needs uh, not much to dwell on what is happening so it's a, a comfortable position for a historian to come in to give a glimpse of what happened uh in the period of say 1960s 
people forget that 1960s was one of the worst period that this republic and this society has actually witnessed it had wars in 62 china 65 pakistan and by 69 70 eastern uh, the bangladesh issue was coming up it had famine and drought in bihar in 67 it had drought in sholapur in maharashtra 672 74 it had uh, riots in ranchi 60 uh, ranchi in 67 jalgaon in 69 70 uh, ahmedabad in 69 and then uh, massive communal polarization in northern india along amu bhu issue it had anti english and anti hindi agitation in both part and it had naxal movements in uh, movement in bihar bengal in part of bihar where hundreds of people uh, were killed enormous amount of violence across the country and yet this is the period when actually if you see the history of institution uh, some of the finest institution actually flourished d school the economist of amartya sen and the team sukumar chakravarti or you name anyone they were there in d school and flourishing lot of debates on development poverty a uh, lot of institutions coming up jnu was coming up 69 sapru house has, was still in its be- best high high time uh, there are madras all universities were doing very well similarly planning commission was coming out with enormous amount of reports the first in fact initiative on green revolution was taken up in 69 uh, 67 69 so a lot of things were happening so there is therefore Uh, a very interesting coincidence that i found while preparing for this lab this uh, small uh, talk that uh, in in a, in, a, in the republic republican crisis that republic faced in the 60s it is no one's business to talk about institutional collapse at that point of time parallel to this was also enormous amount of creative activity in the 60s and you go to any language press any language media this is also the most creative part including you you had in marathi in bengali in tamil this is the time in hindi in fact some of the finest writings of poet poetry literature came up in the 60s so therefore very interesting combination of crisis in terms of communal polarization external threats and natural disaster and drought and poverty uh, and creative uh, um, creative aura of the literature media cinema theater uh, and institutional flourish i think when we talk about governance today some of the issues that i see in the 60s are just reversed today we we have a manufactured security issue that we are th- under threat from many sectors we have a manufactured crisis of institution where institutions were till a decade back were actually coming up 15 central new central universities came up ishr kama came up science institutions came up inspire a program for science fellowship from class 6 onwards is i think the biggest investment anywhere in the world 6000 crore rupees was given to science students to promote science all of these were coming up and suddenly we are under uh, in the throes of institutional crisis the delhi university jnu any good universities or institutions are in crisis so what is this combination i think i'll pause for a moment and tell you a very interesting uh, net uh, i think netflix um program that we saw serial that's called fauda a couple of months back and this was an israeli i think sponsored maybe state sponsored very very sleek very good very efficient production of israeli uh, security agents going into west bank and gaza and all and do operation this was created in 19 uh, 2015 and when the gaza war erupted you could see actually frame by frame that this is actually happening the similar way now while watching me and my wife after the first 15 minutes we wanted to stop this is a four season so it went on for a long time because what we actually what what hit us was the absence of loyalty 
absence of any human virtues that are actually that de de define human being, but it is all about national security. And there's no loyalty, no friendship, no larger virtue. Now that hit us, and that is what today's media actually is bringing to us, where a large chunk of productions, either in uh, primarily in the visual and digital forum, which is taking away some of the finer virtues of not just as citizen, but as human being. So when, when the, the Gaza erupted, one could read some of the Facebook and other um, uh, tweets and uh, messages, and you actually believe it is the same India that actually was in the 60s, when in the face of massive opposition, India actually uh, stood forth on the Vietnam and as well as on 1967. Um, on, on the side of the Arabs. So this is a very peculiar two contrasting uh, situation. Therefore, I thought that let me look at the three big media and their essential, uh, no, I won't say feature, but their the basic essence in which these three media come. One is print, one is uh, television, and one is the digital internet and digital media that we are actually. Why internet and digital media? Our center, which is Center for Media Studies, came up 10 years back, and three of us set up. We wanted to take it further, but thankfully, uh, things are happening. Uh, batch by batch, students are coming. This just a couple of uh, days back, we finished an interview of around 200 students who appear for PhD program. And there are regional distribution of students. Most of them had cleared what is called the National Testing Authority. Uh, many of them should not have passed even their high school, but NTA is bringing a new kind of uh, population. Now, uh, most of them, most of those who came from northern agrarian belt, they all wanted to work on internet and internet media and digital media. Those who are coming from south want to work on professionalization of politics. And those who come from Bengal want to work on print. Now, this is the kind of trend that I saw in the last two, three years. Now, what does it indicate? Nothing much, but it helps me to point my, uh, frame my question that internet, the digital, is a, a kind of big enabler to a large number of people. I was consulting on the thesis that uh, came up in the many, um, uh, in most of the agricultural universities and communication department. They all talk about, all work, the pedagogical domain of digital media or internet media is that it is an enabler of services, governance, and different kind of, uh, so for example, it allows privacy to be retained. So all of these, in fact, Punjab, uh, um, I was quite uh, stuck. Because in 2005 to 2015, a thesis which came up, Sith Punjab was doing the best where people thought that um, it was helping them avoid the corruption that was rampant. So it is in this way the digital media in pedagogical sense which the thesis and research coming up from the institution talking about it being enabler. But I found something slightly different from being it, it's being enabling the government because governance as such as World Bank and others have defined it, have three basic characters, that it is efficient, it is transparent, it helps transparency, and it is responsive. But governance is something much more than these three categories. Governance is about how citizens are related to the state, and how citizens and citizens are related to each other. And third, to me, what kind of legitimacy that the state seeks from its citizens and what kind of counter position that citizen poses to the state in a, when he, he or she feels uh, uh, that the state is not behaving the proper way, that is not legitimate in that sense. It is here that I bring these three media. Print has emerged with the nation. In fact, print has actually helped people construct the nation. People talk about imagined community. I'm not going to that far. But every region, every nook and corner in the country, it is the print journalists, editors, proprietors, anyone who was a public man almost owned a press or a newspaper or a little magazine anywhere in the country. Therefore, all our public men in the late 90, early 19th century onwards 
were actually part of the print media. But media is not just about print. Media is melas, festivals, rumors, everything. Interestingly, an organization which grew during the national movement learned all the art of the national movement mobilization, that is RSS and Hindutva groups. In fact, yesterday, the new science congress that has been inaugurated is called festival. So everything that you see today is festival. That is a lesson that we learned from when Shiv, uh, Tilak started Shivaji festival or Ganpati festival. This is a national Hindu Mela in, uh, in Bengal. These were a festival through which people were tried to be mobilized for the cause of the nation. Now they are mobilized everything. So therefore festival was also. Museum is a media. In that sense we have multiple media forums. But in that print emerged as something which is much more, which is, which allowed plurality to come in. Therefore, when in the 60s, 1960s, Dalit voices came come, were coming up, they came up also through print. When the women were coming up, women voices, they also come in, Manushi and other journals, they come print. So print allowed the diversity of voices, diversity of class, sects, and all other diversities that are regions to allow occupy certain spaces and that's why in the 60s where massive protests massive crisis the state was facing it is a print and this is also the time when some of the finest editors journalists also came up to the indian scenario and that's why the beauty of the print so it has nation in its center nation in its center and also it allows but why is nation and print being at center matters to us it matters because on two counts that this idea of nation allowed itself to be a counterposition to the colonial government because the print came up and the media came up by countering two basic legitimate legitimacy proposition of the colonial government and that is it is a government for developing developing india and it is government for law and order interestingly print counter all those and in fact critical position that print took was the information. It allowed information of language, information and language of development and information and language of law and order to be a kind of central fulcrum to, on which it countered the state. I remind you of one of the finest uh, witness in the commission, Welby Commission in, 18, in the 1890s and uh, 1902, Dadabhai Noroji, when he goes and talk about that poverty, this is a uh, commission on the state of poverty in India and I was looking I was reading those entire witness and I was surprised by the arrogance of the new state apparatus in the in July this year there was a debate in Indian Express if you have noticed where one of the leading economic functionary of this government uh, uh, actually called all economists before her as almost like as the other economists who responded to that as stupid. So this is a debate where the entire economics and statistical programming of, of Indians, Indian, Indian state and Indian government from eight, eight, almost 1890s were actually called uh, wrong or wrong or, ba or badly done. Whereas only the data that is coming up or the uh, statistics that is coming up after 2014 or 16 are supposed to be the correct information, the right information and academic interpreting. So there's no, there's a massive battle going on on the central fulcrum of how print countered colonialism and that is on information. The second was language. If you notice anyone who was anything in the national movement or this from a village to taluka to district to state to the capital was also a good lang language expert in that sense. In fact it is the Indian editors of the 19th century onward who actually defined the regional languages or gave them a stature. So in fact from Bankim Chandra, Ram Mohan, if they anyone, Tilak or anyone, they were also good in the language and they were refining the language. And it is that their language, their effort at language was not just literary activity, it was also trying to be sensitive to what colonial uh, government and state machinery and um, colonial state itself was trying to legitimize itself through a particular language. Today we are actually coming back to the same position because one of the key preposition or proposition of the colonial argument for legitimacy was law and order. 
suddenly we have come up to the same position where the state says we are here to provide law and order, better law and order. And in some sense, we are not able to find a response to that. In fact, it's a very interesting position that almost every newspaper and Bharat is right to actually give us why it is happening, that it is almost succumbing to the same language that yes, the state is doing, we are better off than any time in the history. Now, why is it happening? And that brings, up, brings me to the second two media, and that is one is visual and one is digital. And it, television, actually, when it comes to India in the 70s, primarily it came in 59, but 70s is a time when it was promoted. But there are some disjuncture which media uh, television scholars have not actually talked about it. But that disjuncture apart, what television's actual role was envisaged was that it will bring the nation and nation's diversity to, to actually uh, constitute a new nation or nation as it is going in the 70s. So it was about diversity. Medium itself has, uh, uh, is capable of actually accommodating diversity. But what is happening now is that that same diversity, it's not just now, it, was, it started happening in the 90s itself, is becoming a kind of, as jo uh, Roger Brubaker calls it, nationalizing state. The state is nationalizing. Now that the diversity became a kind of, almost a kind of, it, it was bypassed. And what is happening, television is centralizing the whole nation, centralizing in a manner which the nation doesn't want to be uh, done. A nation doesn't want to be living in that kind of centralization. And in that process of centralization, couple of things that television programming did actually help. One is making election as a central fulcrum to define television programming. And I would blame even NDTV for that when it came. Because what happened was as if election is the politics. Now, I'll connect it to what is happening in the visual mode in the television and, and you will understand why it is becoming so central. Because politics is not about election. It is something much more beyond that. It is about looking for an alternative possibility. Now, election, and then you have, you can actually read the titles of the election debates now. And it is very interesting. Those who want to circumscribe media by stiff regulation actually promote this election debate. So there is, therefore, you can almost see the investment of some kind of energy into the election debate. And the second is an increasing, increasing denunciation and an increasing denunciation of institutions and expertise of some kind. Now, therefore, it brings me to the third uh, genre, and that is uh, in internet and digital. Digital and internet, as I said, was seen as an enab enabler, and it is an enabler to many of us, all of us maybe, but it is also doing something very, very significant. It is now bringing television and cinematic mode to our everyday experience, everyday experience, and that experience is now inundated with, I'm just taking one example, what is I call governance cinema or governance serials or governance. These are governance. You say you if for the last 20 years if you have seen the serials like Naya or anything that you see, particularly if you see the American serials, they have, they have actually uh, cop maybe copied us, but they have done better. For example, designated survivor or something of that kind, where the president is killed or president is being killed. Similarly, for us, the serial, the cinemas, and the TV that have come together is actually doing something much more than that. It is constantly giving us this victim perpetrator reversal syndrome that we were the victim. So victimhood is the language in which the whole country now kind of uh, gloats over that we are victim. And the perpetrators were something and we have to reverse the location. That is a language which is becoming a kind of universal centralizing language which is superimposed on the election debate. And the second is very significant is that all this program, and that's why these biopics, Indira Gandhi, Lal Bahadur Shastri, Tashkent File, Kerala File, these are biopics in the manner, these are actually, and then you have the CIA 
Jawan, Pathan, every young person today anywhere in the country wants to be part of the raw, part of the CBI, part of the army. This new fascination, this new imagination to be part of the governing thing is actually doing something much more than just helping governments. In fact, it is while the announcements from the platforms of the government or governing requirement is that people do their jobs without government support that set up startup. But the imagination is that everybody should work in raw IP, CBI, military, army, somewhere in the government, some minister. So the whole, whole language of media is inundated with the language of governance. In that governance, there is no alternative imagination, no alternative polity. And that's why we are in a situation that we actually allowing a new legal code to get passed, which is actually talking in the same language, which could be the colonial language of law and order. We are debating on development. We are asking for debating in the uh, development indicators, and we were not uh, allowed to debate as Dada Bhai Noroji debated in 1900. So therefore, the whole situation today in terms of the keys to governance is that we are looking for a citizenry of the biggest or largest populated country in the world and not allowing them through our different media to have different imaginations of politics, different imagination of civic association and different, so, uh, different imagine, imageries of creating new institutions. And that's why I think I agree with what Bharabhaya said that we are in a morass where institutions Therefore, in 69, six, in the 60s, where there were chaos all over, violence, and yet when the Judicial Commission, Madhwan Commission on the Jalgaon riot, or uh, Sinha Commission and Ranchi riot, they gave fascinating um, uh, judgments. Today, we are no even cynical about any judgment coming from any commission because, because what we had in the 60s was still the dominance of the idea that we can counter the narrative of the law and order and development by posing different set of imagination, which that imagination we are increasingly day by day being constricted of. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Rakesh. Uh, that was, uh, I mean, you have enlarged the, the debate and uh, you have brought in a lot of elements. I think uh, the, the victim of the syndrome which you mentioned, I think is, uh, is critical to the, the debate and also that uh, you, the different imaginations are being knocked off from the radar and there is a kind of a straight jacketing going on. Now I would request Anna Mohanty to come in please. I think Bharat Bhushan and Rakesh Bhaktiyal have covered a very large canvas. I may end up repeating some of the points which they covered. But before I begin, I would like to thank IIC and Bhartam Memorial Foundation for inviting me to participate in this seminar. Aj Shuhas Bhattar said, this is the ninth edition of the annual seminar with the series Keys in Governance. Previous years, as you said, we have discussed about role of bureaucracy, role of judiciary. This time is the turn of the media. And the topic, as we all know, is the role of mainstream media in democratic governance, governance in democratic societies. As Bharat began his presentation saying about the ideal role, yes, we need to make a distinction between what is what has been the ideal role and what has been the actual reality playing out in different democratic countries. When it comes to the ideal role, yes, media should communicate 
but it must not communicate what the state wants it to do. It must communicate what the state wants to hide. Yes, the media must play a role in setting the agenda. It must not, maybe government wants Ram Mandi to be the frame in every newspaper, all the television channel. But a consensus media would like to cover, maybe Manipur, maybe increasing communalization process set in by the ruling party. Or it can be also the issue of unemployment, it issues which the government will like to push to the back burner. But it's important task of the media to bring it to the center stage and begin a intense discussion on the matter. That's the role of the ideal media. But as Bharat and Rakesh Vakil presented, what is playing out in the street, in democracies across the world is completely different. I would say maybe in some Western countries, maybe United States of America in, in particular, the media still approximates to that ideal role. Well, we all know, and in fact, Shwas mentioned about manufacturing consent. Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky's famous drive against American media, manufacturing consent for legitimizing the ruling establishment there. So it certainly is true, but still, relatively speaking, American media is free. A New York Times, a Washington Post, a CNN can rip apart the policies of President Trump and President Biden. We all know, and without any kind of backlash. We all know President Trump railed against, cried foul against Jeff Bezos, the owner of the Washington Post. But he couldn't do a damn to him personally or to his business, Amazon. There are many business houses in America. There are many owners of the media organizations in America who challenge the administration head on and go about the task in a carefree manner. Can the media organizations, their owners, the business houses do it in India? Answer is clearly no. Because in India, taking on the state today amounts to inviting retribution. You do it, there will be ED, there will be CBI, there will be income tax. And of course, nothing may come out of it, but process is punishment. We know the example of one Ashok Lavasa, election commissioner, who gave a dissenting note, said the prime minister, home minister must be taken to task for violating the code of conduct. And conditions are created for him to be forced out of office. So this is the, exactly the way the media works, as my predecessor spoke. Television channels have become openly servile. The way they invite the prime minister to their functions, the anniversaries, and cower before him, the owners, that tells us that they cannot stand up to the state in holding up the truth. Newspapers are possibly a little better. They are less constant. But still, there is a Lakshman Rekha. You can criticize this ministry, that ministry. But when it comes to the big boss, the god of the establishment, then you will have to exercise restraint. That same tragedy that we find in this country, that even 
a newspaper whose masthead reads journalism of courage. It had shown that courage during emergency, even during the Congress rule. But today it is a pale shadow of its former self. Today it tries to live up to his, its image by doing some critical stories, but it again makes extra efforts to ensure to, that it is balanced by presenting three stories which seem pans to the ruling establishment, to the Prime Minister himself. So this is a scenario where we, what L.K. Advani called when the media is asked to bend, they crawl. Perhaps that was true then, but it is truer now. We have two sets of media, one set of media which cower under fear and another set of media which have become participant in that state process to reap the harvest. When media organizations have turned this servile, naturally the state of governance is desperately sad situation. We have a government which is ramming through anti-democratic legislations through parliament. We have a government which is taking to task any institution which stands up to the constitutional values. Then, if that is the task, that is the situation today, then how does one confront the situation? Many organizations which support the today, today's administration, the today's establishment, would argue that these media houses have turned against the government at a time. This is the government which Ratis Bhaktil present. Uh, refer to that India under Prime Minister Modi is making giant strides in different fields. In the international fora, in the Modi regime, India is a force to be reckoned with. If that is the situation, then why do we confront this state as not doing anything? That's a question that they asked, but that's where we need to find if there was, would have been a, some element of truth in this argument. But if there would have been free and fair and transparent media, then that would have made that calibrated judgment. Then that is the media which would have brought to focus where the truth lies. But unfortunately, we, when media has positioned themselves as cheerleader for the government, all that they do, that they have reduced themselves to become the megaphones to highlight the achievements of the government. But when it comes to pointing out the acts of omission and commission, their lips are sealed, their computer keys are frozen. That's where many members of the protagonists of the government and the ruling establishment would argue that this concept of speaking truth to power, the adversarial relationship with the government is passing. Media should be active partners of the government, must highlight the developmental work is doing. This is the spin they give to the concept of development journalism. But I must say that this spin is not of recent origin. We have had this happening for years. I remember when I, when I went to Patna, to begin my journalistic career after Delhi, Lalu Jadabu was ruling the waves. The first message I got then was this. 
If you want to be pro-poor, pro-people, you have to support Laluji. If you criticize him, if you criticize his policies, then you'll be branded as a stooge of the upper caste to discredit a backward caste leader. It was not simply true of the executive, even the legislature that he commanded also took a position. That time, we got a report from the Auditor General. Astounding report. It said, many members of the Legislative Council had reimbursed rupees 2 crore each towards travel expenses in one year, one financial year. That was astounding. A bat of envelope arithmetic would tell that these people had spent almost 50,000 rupees every day. If they traveled all 365 days of the year, this crush in the country should see some developmental work. We thought we'll do this story. And we said, how many days the council seats? 12 days a year. No business to transact, only pleasantries. We asked our readers, people of Bihar, whether this is not a white elephant, so whether it should be abolished. All hell broke loose. The chairman issued notice saying that we are anti national, we are questioning, we are inciting people against a constitutional body. We were agent provocateurs and we were threatened with arrest and jail. So there are two sides to this perspective. If you support Modi ji, support Laluji, you become a pro poor journalist. You oppose him, then you are indulging in yellow journalism. But then just flip that scenario. Just a few months ago, in this IIC premises itself, I attended a function. A function which was a first or second anniversary of a pro-government tabloid and digital platform. A top bureaucrat of the country, a top law officer of the country, and a retired judge of the Supreme Court of the Dias Safana. The bureaucrat and the judge, bureaucrat and the law officer, of course, sent peons to the government to Prime Minister Modi and congratulated the publisher and the editor in chief. You are doing great work by carrying Modiji's message to the people. You are countering the urban noxels who are spreading negative words against this progressive establishment. But what, in fact, surprised me was the reaction of the retired Supreme Court judge who happens to be, happens to chair a constitutional body which is supposed to protect the rights of journalists. And she said, it is the patriotic duty of every journalist to spread the developmental message of the government to large number of people, as much as many people as possible. When you are working in tandem with the government, you are taking the country forward. When you are criticizing the government, you are pulling it back. I felt that day in the frame of things of this honorable retired Supreme Court judge, journalism is possibly only a PR job and media organizations are nothing but PR agencies. But then that is the reality today. I'd say Mr. Barker, show us that perhaps your idea of and our idea of ideal journalism is passe, is old fashioned. Today, free and independent media is not key to democratic governance. Today, free and independent media is divisive, is anti national. Today, it is the pliant media, the servile media, which is the key to governance. Whether that governance is democratic, whether it is good governance or it's bad governance, that's all of our call. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, NRM, for that. Uh, uh,
very forthright uh, presentation. You know, speaking truth to power is now a big question. Uh, now, uh, before I ask uh, Basha to come in, I, I just want uh, to raise, uh, which somehow has been missed out, is that, uh, uh, you know, this uh, uh, Doordarshan and All India Radio are supposed to be public service broadcasters, but they are uh, what we call pretenders. You know, they are not uh, public service broadcasters because uh, if to be a public service broadcaster, there are three, three uh, elements which are totally missing. One is independence, which is guaranteed by independent, uh, which is guaranteed by appropriate structures. There is no financial independence. There is no public accountability through parliament. So it's a, it's a sham that, uh, that uh, you know, this whole, uh, uh, the, the, in fact, I was personally involved in the movement to create Prasar Bharti, but it's all gone asunder. So uh, before I request Basha to come in, I, we must uh, honor you with the, if we missed the beginning. Asha, please go ahead. बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया सुहास जी और फाउंडेशन की इस मुद्दे पर आपने ये एक लेक्चर सीरीज आप कायम रखे हुए हैं गवर्नेंस को लेकर और मीडिया को लेकर क्योंकि काफी बातें from a different perspective uh, it is already on the flow मैं थोड़ा अपने पर्सनल एक्सपीरियंसेस के साथ जो महसूस कर रही हूँ उसे आपके साथ शेयर करना चाहती हूँ यहाँ पर मुझे इस बात को कहने में कोई गुरेज कोई कंफ्यूजन नहीं है कि जिस मीडिया की हम बात कर रहे हैं जिस इंडिपेंडेंट फ्री प्लोरिस्टिक मीडिया की हम बात कर रहे हैं और जिसके साथ मेरे ख्याल से यहाँ पे जितने लोग हैं जो यहाँ पर मौजूद हैं अलग अलग फेजेस मीडिया के इंडियन डेमोक्रेसी के आप सब लोग देखते रहे हैं यू हैव बीन विटनेस टू डिफरेंट फेजेस इट इज अ वेरी सैड सिचुएशन राइट नाउ very sad and this i'm stating i'm journalist in delhi from 96 so different regimes and major regimes which we have seen we have done stories they are in opposition now so basically jo baatein aayi hain usme i want to put straight forward that media can be independent when the democracy and the different institutions of the democracy are independent. Right now in 2024, I just uh, went for a, one of my friend book release, Being Muslim in a Hindu Nation, Hindu India. What important book hai. Aap sab log jante hi honge. अभी कुछ दो दिन पहले ही उसका रिलीज था यहीं दिल्ली में सो द होल नेशन ऑफ अ हिंदू नेशन एंड बीइंग अ सिटीजन ऑफ अ हिंदू नेशन हाउ इट फील्स वेदर इट इज अ क्वेश्चन फॉर अ मुस्लिम टू डिसाइड वेदर इट इज अ क्वेश्चन ऑफ अ क्रिश्चियन टू डिसाइड और अ माइनॉरिटी टू डिसाइड और अ दलित टू डिसाइड और आदिवासी टू डिसाइड हाउ वी सी दिस थ्रेट whether we are as a media person when we are talking here right now we know the whole corporate media quote unquote they are batting in a very beautiful manner you cannot imagine also mujhe lagta hai ki hum sab log jo yahan baithe hain is kamre mein kisi ne shayad kalpana nahi ki hogi ki media ki yah gati hogi ki aap surgical strike se टूरिस्ट स्ट्राइक टूरिज्म स्ट्राइक तक पहुंचते हैं मतलब क्या जबरदस्त लाइन लेंथ है 
मतलब देखकर भी अचंभा होता है कि ये हम कोई फिल्म देख रहे हैं कोई फिक्शन देख रहे हैं क्या देख रहे हैं बायकॉट मालदीव मतलब पठान से लेकर मालदीव पहुंचते हैं बायकॉट एंड इट्स ट्रेंड एवरीबडी इज कोटिंग सो ये जो प्रोग्रेस है मीडिया की क्योंकि तो यही मीडिया दरअसल पहुंच रहा है लोगों तक यही लोगों का लोगों के बीच जा रहा है नरेशन सेटअप कर रहा है एजेंडा सेटअप कर रहा है और इसको देखते हुए मुझे लगता है कि जो सबसे बड़ा क्वेश्चन हमारे दिमाग में है मेरे दिमाग में है बींग इंडियन सिटीजन बींग इंडियन वुमेन बींग जर्नलिस्ट कि फाइनली द नेशन विच इज बींग बिल्ड जो देश बन रहा है उस देश में मैं कहाँ रहूंगी उस देश में मेरा क्या है उस देश में मेरे अधिकार का क्या है सो कॉल्ड द हिंदू वुमेन ऑफ दिस कंट्री उसका क्या है अ हिंदू जर्नलिस्ट उसका क्या है क्योंकि तो ये मैं सारे अपने पर्सनल एक्सपीरियंसेस आपके सामने शेयर कर रही हूँ ये जो सारे कोर्ट्स एंड कोर्ट्स बता रही हूँ मैं आपको अब देखिए राजस्थान के एक माननीय मंत्री रिस्पेक्टेड मिनिस्टर हु इज जस्ट अभी सरकार बनी है उन्होंने पब्लिक मीटिंग में और ये मुझे लगता है कि बहुत इंटरेस्टिंग है कि विकसित भारत संकल्प यात्रा में कहा क्योंकि अब इंडिया तो कहना बहुत मुश्किल है वो कॉलोनियल है तो आपको भारत बोलना है अब हम भारतवासी हैं इंडिया वासी नहीं है तो आप देखिए उसमें उन्होंने नरेशन दिया कि ज्यादा से ज्यादा बच्चे पैदा करने चाहिए औरतों को ज्यादा से ज्यादा बच्चे पैदा करने चाहिए और फिर वो भी बताते हैं कि मेरे आठ बच्चे हैं दो बीवियां हैं सब कुछ चलता है मुख्यमंत्री भी हैं सारे लोग हैं वहां पर अब आप उनका भाषण जब मैं सुन रही थी और एक दिल्ली से लेकर पूरे उत्तर भारत में जो कोहराम मचाने वाले बाबा हैं धीरेन्द्र शास्त्री बागेश्वर धाम वाले जिसके आगे द मीडिया नतमस्तक रहता है पर्ची खुलवाता है फ्यूचर देखता है या बाकी और तमाम मतलब फिलअप करते जाइए वो पब्लिक डोमेन में हजारों लोगों के बीच में भारतीय महिला का अपमान करते रहते हैं वो बोलते हैं कि जो औरत बच्चा नहीं पैदा करती वो ये है जो लड़के नहीं पैदा करती वो ये है और मैं ये कोई माजलाई सेक्शन की बात नहीं कर रही क्योंकि ये वो लोग हैं जो ब्रांड एम्बेसडर हैं जो चुनाव जीतने के लिए बुलाए जाते हैं जिनको सुनने के लिए लाखों की तादाद में इनकी दो मीटिंग्स मैंने खुद पर्सनली अटेंड की हैं जहां पे ये नरेशन क्योंकि समझना बहुत जरूरी है एज अ जर्नलिस्ट कि कौन लोग हैं जो सामने बैठे हुए हैं सामने औरतें ही बैठी हुई हैं उन औरतों में मार्जनाइज कम्युनिटी की औरतें सबसे ज्यादा संख्या में बैठी हुई हैं जब वो बताते हैं कि एक हिंदू औरत को चार लड़के पैदा करने चाहिए और एक लड़का ये करना चाहिए दूसरा लड़का ये करना चाहिए तो ये जो नरेशन बिल्डअप है हिंदू राष्ट्र का दरअसल वो एक महिला की कोख पर ही डेवलप है हमारी जो पूरी बॉडी है उसी पर खेला जा रहा है और ये सारे के सारा जो प्रचार तंत्र है जिससे जनरली लोग सोचते हैं कि जो मिडिल क्लास है जो आई है जो पढ़ा लिखा सेक्शन है वो अलग है दे आर इलिटरेट जो लोग जा रहे हैं ऐसा नहीं है आप जाके देखिए जग्गी के यहाँ सभाओं में जाके देखिए जब वो डांस करते हैं तो सामने बैठने वाले लोग कौन हैं सुनना चाहिए देखना चाहिए तब आपको रीढ़ में कपकपी महसूस होगी तब लगेगा कि ये दुनिया ये भारत कितनी तेजी से बदल गया है सर्विंग ऑफिसर्स जाते हैं जो रेपिस्ट और मर्डरर है जिसको आज कोर्ट uh, से एक राहत मिली एक पत्रकार के खिलाफ देरा सच्चा राम रहीम कन्विक्टेड है वो ऐसा नहीं कि कन्विक्शन नहीं है कन्विक्टेड है वो लेकिन जब वो बाहर जाता है पैरोल पर बाहर आता है फरलो पे बाहर आता है पत्रकार बिरादरी तो जितनी पहुंचती पहुंचती है आईएएस आईपीएस ऑफिसर्स जितने पहुंचते हैं डीएम जितने पहुंचते हैं वो देख के लगता है कि बेसिकली Where is the freedom of speech? For whom the freedom of speech is? कहाँ पर है 
क्योंकि वो जो सारा नरेशन बिल्डअप है वो एक मनुवादी मनुस्मृति वाला नरेशन बिल्डअप है जिसको बहुत बहुत पावरफुली ऊपर से लेकर नीचे तक बैठा दिया गया है और यहां पर आप देखिए कि जो मीडिया है मैं पावर की तो बात ही नहीं कर रही मैं तो उस अनसाइंटिफिक आइडियोलॉजी की बात कर रही हूं जो कहेगा कि मोर के आंसू से बच्चा पैदा हो जाता है और आप देखिए उनके जो फॉलोअर्स बढ़े हैं और उनको जिस तरह से प्रमोशन मिला है मीडिया के स्पॉन्सर्स जिस तरह से वे बने हैं पन्नों के पन्नों पे वो छाए हुए हैं इससे जो एक पूरी की पूरी अवैज्ञानिक सोसाइटी बिल्डअप हुई है जिसको चैलेंज एक जमाने में बाबा साहब भीमराव अंबेडकर ने अपनी राइटिंग से किया उससे पहले सावित्री बाई फूले ने चैलेंज किया कि आपको ज्ञान चाहिए आपको नॉलेज चाहिए बहुत मुश्किल से हम यहाँ पहुंचे हैं एज ए इंडियन वुमेन आई फील कि हमारी जो जर्नी है बहुत मुश्किल से यहाँ पहुंची है बहुत आसानी से हमारे पास थाली में परोस की चीजें नहीं आई हैं और आप देखिए किस तेजी से उस सारी चीजों को वो सारी जो फाइट रही है कि ज्ञान हासिल ज्ञान यानी क्या ज्ञान है नॉलेज मींस व्हाट साइंस कांग्रेस नहीं होती है इतने साल में साइंटिस्ट बोलने को तैयार नहीं होते पूरा का पूरा नोशन चेंज हो जाता है यू डोंट फाइंड एनी वन हु इज स्पीकिंग फॉर द साइंस आई एम सेइंग नो डोंट स्पीक फॉर पॉलिटिकल राइट्स लेकिन आपके जो एक वैज्ञानिक सोच है जो यह बताती है कि जाति व्यवस्था एक सबसे बड़ा फ्रॉड है धर्म के आधार पर नफरत एक सबसे बड़ा फ्रॉड है लेकिन आप देखेंगे कि वो सारे जो डायमेंशन हैं वो सारे डायमेंशन पब्लिक डिस्कोर्स से तो गायब है ही और मीडिया के एजेंडे में इस कॉर्पोरेट मीडिया के एजेंडे में भी नहीं है लगातार एक ढंग की इमेज एक ढंग के चेहरे एक ढंग की चीजें प्रमोट करके जैसे अयोध्या को जैसे हरिद्वार को जैसे तमाम काशी को एक ही रंग में रंग दिया गया है आप जाइए ना हरिद्वार जाइए मैं तो अभी आई हूं एक ही रंग की सारी मूर्ति सारी बिल्डिंग्स पूरा रास्ता एक रंग का है देख के बिल्कुल आंख में चुभन होने लगती है अगर इस कमरे में हम सब एक ही रंग पहन लेते तो बहुत ही मुश्किल हो जाता कैमरा पर्सन को बहुत मुश्किल हो जाती लेकिन आप देखिए कि ये जो एक पूरी कोशिश है जो इतनी बड़ी डिबेट अभी खड़ी हुई शाकाहार और मांसाहार की आप उसमें देखिए कि लोग कहाँ खड़े हैं आप राम को किनारे भी रख दीजिए कि राम मांसाहारी थे शाकाहारी थे लेकिन आप एक बड़ी सेलिब्रिटी एक बड़े जर्नलिस्ट एक मीडिया हाउस बताइए जिसके पास दम हो ये कहने का कि वाल्मीकि रामायण जिनके नाम पर आप यहाँ पर बना रहे हैं एयरपोर्ट आप उन्हीं को कोट कर दीजिए उन्हीं को ले आइए आप लेकिन ये हिम्मत होना कि हम एक तर्क के पक्ष में खड़े होंगे लॉजिक के साथ बात करना और लॉजिक के साथ क्योंकि मीडिया की जो भूमिका जिसका जिक्र हुआ है वो यह रहा है कि उसने अलग अलग दौरों में जो अविज्ञान रहा है उसको काउंटर किया है सत्य शोधक समाज रहा है यहां पर जिसने उस समय तमाम रिचुअल्स को तमाम नौटंकियों को तमाम फ्रॉड को उस समय काउंटर किया इतना साहस रखा लेकिन आज देखिए जो रिवर्स गियर घूमा है उस रिवर्स गियर में जो हमारा मीडिया है जो सो कॉल्ड कॉर्पोरेट मीडिया है और यहाँ मैं ये जोर दे के कहना चाहूंगी कि जो कॉर्पोरेट मीडिया दिखाई दे रहा है उसकी जो ओनरशिप है क्योंकि राइज ऑफ हिंदुत्व की जो पूरी थ्योरी है जो पूरी इकोनॉमिक्स है वो कंसंट्रेशन ऑफ पावर यहाँ है तो कंसनट्रेशन ऑफ इकोनॉमिक पावर यहाँ है एंड बोथ आर लिंकड अप बोथ हैव ज्वाइन हैंड टूगेदर अंबानी अडानी के साथ जो हिंदुत्व फासीवाद का राइज है उसमें अगर आप मीडिया और फ्रीडम ऑफ एक्सप्रेशन देखते हैं तो वो फ्रीडम ऑफ एक्सप्रेशन इस तरह से दिखाई देता है कि आपको सारे मीडिया प्लेटफॉर्म्स पर एक साथ एक ढंग से एक तरफ भगवान राम की मूर्ति है और दूसरी तरफ मूर्ति आपको दिखाई देती है कृष्ण लला की यानी एजेंडा सेट है आफ्टर राम मूर्ति राम मंदिर दे आर गोइंग फॉर 
मथुरा ये जो नरेशन है हेट्रेड का ये इट इज नॉट जस्ट लाइक दिस इट हैज कम इट हैज अ हिस्ट्री इट हैज अ हिस्ट्री कि ये जो पूरा का पूरा नोशन बिल्डअप हुआ है उस नोशन में एजेंडे पर क्या है और डेफिनेटली मुझे इस बात से उम्मीद मिलती है कि जब हम बात कर रहे हैं भारत के भारत के मीडिया की और अक्सर होता है कि तमाम लोग ये सोचते हैं और सोचना अच्छा भी लगता है हमको कि वेस्टर्न मीडिया इज मोर ओपन वहां डेमोक्रेटिक स्पेस है वहां आप लिख सकते हैं बट यू सी गाजा गाजा इज द टेस्ट केस न्यूयॉर्क टाइम्स अपने एडिटर को निकाल देता है भाई अपने लोगों को दिखा देता है कि उसने साइन किया है गाजा के समर्थन में मेहदी हसन बाहर हो गए उन्होंने इस्तीफा दे दिया अपने प्लेटफॉर्म से और रिपोर्टिंग जो वॉर एक उत्सव उत्सव की बात हुई इस पूरे मीडिया में जो कॉर्पोरेट मीडिया है जो वेस्टर्न मीडिया है वॉर इज अ फेस्टिवल जितनी किलिंग हो इराक को आप नस्तनाबूद कर दीजिए अफगानिस्तान को नस्तनाबूद कर दीजिए वियतनाम से लेके जितने युद्ध और अभी गाजा क्यों नहीं जो मतलब वेस्टर्न मीडिया का जो रियल फेस है वो तो गाजा जेनोसाइड बता रहा है कि कैसे खड़े हैं लोग कहाँ पे कवरेज है अगर अलजीरा जैसा चैनल ना हो जिससे आप सहमत होइए असहमत होइए यू विल नॉट नो वट हैपन इन गाजा लेकिन आप क्या सोचते हैं कि जिन लोगों ने वहां पर जर्नलिज्म किया जो कर रहे हैं मर रहे हैं सबसे ज्यादा पत्रकार मारे गए गाजा में रिपोर्टिंग करते हुए क्या द सो कॉल्ड वेस्टर्न वर्ल्ड और उसके जो एक हजार अवार्ड हैं वो किसी इन पत्रकारों को जाएंगे हम सब जानते हैं कि कभी नहीं जाएंगे क्योंकि नोशन तय है ये तो युद्ध के पक्ष में ही रिपोर्टिंग के लिए बने हुए हैं तो ये एक जो पैराडॉक्स है जहां पर किसके पक्ष में हम खड़े होते हैं और किसके विपक्ष में हम खड़े होते हैं और जो इंटरेस्ट है जो वेस्टेड इंटरेस्ट है वो वेस्टेड इंटरेस्ट कहाँ किस तरह से निकलता है मुझे लगता है कि ये एक बहुत बड़ा सवाल है और जैसा मैंने पहले जिक्र किया कि एक तरफ यह मीडिया है जो ऑलमोस्ट परसेप्शन बनाने की यानी अवधारणा बनाने की इंडस्ट्री में तब्दील हो गया है सुबह से उसके पास जो टूल किट होता है आप देखिए वो टूल किट चलता रहता है मुझे यहाँ आने में देर हुई दो वजहों से महाराष्ट्र पे स्पीकर महोदय देने वाले थे फैसला हम सबको पता था कि क्या देंगे जब चुनाव आयोग ने नहीं दिया जब सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने नहीं दिया तो स्पीकर महोदय तो वही देंगे जो उनको देना था लेकिन तब भी बतौर जर्नलिस्ट तो आपको देखना है और इसी बीच कांग्रेस ने अपना स्टैंड लिया कि वो बाईस जनवरी को नहीं जाएगी वहां पर और जैसे ही ये स्टेटमेंट छोटा सा जारी हुआ कि 22 जनवरी को जो अयोध्या में प्राण प्रतिष्ठा है उसमें वो नहीं जाएगी क्योंकि अर्ध आधा बना हुआ टेंपल है आप देखिए कि एक ही साथ एक ही तर्ज पर हर जगह कि जो राम को नहीं मानते वो देश के नहीं हैं पूरा जो नरेशन है तो आज दिक्कत ये है कि जो अवधारणा बनाने का काम है जो परसेप्शन बनाने का इंडस्ट्री है जिसे हम कहते हैं जो ट्रोल आर्मी है ट्रोल आर्मी से भी आगे बढ़ के जो कॉर्पोरेट मीडिया है वो अपनी भूमिका अदा करता है और ये सिर्फ राम मंदिर का सवाल नहीं कोरोना में भी यही किया था तबलीकी जमात हो सारे लोगों का जो पूरा नरेशन था नोटबंदी हो एक भी दलित एट्रोसिटी हो हाथरस दलित एट्रोसिटी में आप देखिए कि जिस लड़की ने उसको कवर किया बॉडी दिखाई कि जलाई थी उसके बाद वो जर्नलिस्ट कहाँ है किस हाल में है उस मीडिया घराने ने उसे कैसे बाहर किया ये सारी कहानियां पब्लिक तक नहीं पहुंचती और उसके बाद हाथरस हैज बिकम अ कॉन्स्पिरेसी हाथरस में क्या हुआ लड़की के साथ क्या जस्टिस हुआ वो नरेशन नहीं है तो मैं यहां पर ये कहना चाहती हूं कि एक तरफ जिस मीडिया की हम बात कर रहे हैं जो मीडिया घर घर पहुंच रहा है वो एक सरकार के साथ जुड़ा हुआ उसका एक अभिन्न हिस्सा है उसके प्रचार प्रसार को ही वो पीआर को ही एक अपनी ड्यूटी के तौर पर निभाता है कभी वो मोदी जी से आम कटवा देता है खा खाएंगे चूसेंगे 
से अब यात्रा बहुत आगे बढ़ गई है लेकिन वहीं दूसरी तरफ मीडिया में आज की तारीख में भी जो डिजिटल मीडिया है बाकी मीडिया है उनमें ऐसे पत्रकारों की संख्या आज भी बहुत ज्यादा है जो जान को जोखिम में डाल के जिस पर हम डिस्कस कर रहे हैं की टू गवर्नेंस फ्री एंड प्लूरलिस्टिक इंडिपेंडेंट मीडिया उस मीडिया को जिंदा रखने के लिए काम कर रहे हैं और इन्हीं मीडिया घरानों से मीडिया के इंडिविजुअल से जो पावर है उसे खौफ है क्योंकि डिसेंट इज अ क्राइम आज की तारीख में आप किसी भी फॉर्म में डिसेंट रखते हैं आप एमपी हो तो 149 फोर्टी बाहर हो जाएंगे लेकिन ऐसे माहौल में भी मुझे इस बात को कहने में गर्व होता है कि मैं उस बिरादरी से जुड़ी हुई हूं जो यूएपीए का केस लग जाए ईडी आ जाए बैंक अकाउंट फ्रीज हो जाए हमारे घर में सुबह साढ़े छह बजे स्पेशल सेल के लोग आ जाए और जो सिर्फ और सिर्फ ये पूछे कि आप इतने सीनियर हैं आप किसान आंदोलन क्यों कवर कर रही थी आप हाथरस क्यों गई थी आप कोरोना के समय अपनी गाड़ी लेके क्यों कवर कर रही थी ये क्राइम है जर्नलिज्म में आज की तारीख में बता रही हूं आपको सब कुछ होने के बावजूद ये जो सारा सेक्शन है ये जो मीडिया में लोग हैं ये अभी भी कोशिश कर रहे हैं और इन, इन्होंने एक जगह भी बनाई है एक स्पेस इन्होंने क्रिएट किया है इस तरह के जर्नलिज्म को द जर्नलिज्म को जिंदा रखने के लिए उसके प्लेटफॉर्म्स अलग अलग हो सकते हैं उसके चेहरे अलग अलग हो सकते हैं उसकी लैंग्वेजेस अलग अलग हो सकती हैं और पूरे देश में कश्मीर इसका टेस्ट केस है सबसे पहले वहां प्रेस क्लब खत्म किया गया सबसे पहले पत्रकारों को खत्म किया गया सबसे पहले पुलिस दर मिलने के बाद भी महिला फोटोग्राफर को जाने नहीं दिया गया बट आई सेल्यूट टू देम फ्रॉम दिस प्लेटफॉर्म many of them are my young friends they still have not left their camera they still are reporting they are reporting in a very different forms from manipur to kashmir to any place you find ye jo ek jazba hai mujhe lagta hai ye darasal wahi jazba hai jisko hum aap shayad isi wajah se hum yahan baithe bhi hue hain jo democratic spaces lagatar kam hue hain उसके बावजूद अगर इस तरह की एक मीटिंग हो रही है इन सब चीजों पे चर्चा हो रही है दरअसल यही एक होप का जरिया भी है कि इस तरह की धारा क्योंकि ये धारा दिखती नहीं है अगर आप टीवी ऑन कर दीजिएगा गलती से तो आपको लगेगा कि सारा देश तो गया बाइकआउट मालदीव्स में और अब राम मंदिर में लेकिन नहीं मुझे लगता है कि एक ऐसी जमात है ऐसे लोग हैं और बड़ी संख्या में लोग हैं जिसमें सीनियर से लेकर बहुत नौजवान लोग हैं जो आज भी अंबेडकर को लेकर चलते हैं बात करते हैं सावित्री बाई फूले को याद करते हैं भगत सिंह को याद करते बहुत लंबी लेगेसी है जर्नलिज्म की ये सारे लोग जर्नलिज्म ही के डिफरेंट फॉर्म्स डिफरेंट चेहरे हैं जो विरासत में मिले हैं तो ये मुझे लगता है कि जो नए प्रयोग हैं ये दरअसल जो भारतीय लोकतंत्र का संकट है उसमें बचने की और जिंदा रहने की जैसे बिल्किस ने कल कहा ना कि मैं अब सांस ले सकती हूं मुझे महसूस होता है तो दरअसल हम सब अपने ब्रीथिंग स्पेसेस की तलाश कर रहे हैं और अगर ये ब्रीथिंग स्पेस तलाश करने की जो जद्दोजहद है यह मिल जाए तो ऑक्सीजन की कमी नहीं पड़ेगी शुक्रिया थैंक यू भाषा Uh, in fact brought out the day to day trials and tribulations of a practicing journalist in the kind of environment we are functioning thank you very much now we'll open the floor to questions uh, uh, we have probably uh, time is running out so we'll take about five questions can you just walk up to the podium here because there's just one camera and we are covering it live so just walk up to the ca- the, the podium and uh, introduce yourself and uh, uh, ask what you want from the panel please go ahead there anybody there are no questions so you'll have to come up here sir if you no no it won't be caught on the camera is going live no if you don't mind that's the scenario 
if you if you know sir just come quickly that's okay you say anybody else who wants to come in yeah come call come here so the gentleman comes yeah just introduce yourself yeah good yeah, evening sir good evening to all of the panel it was such a wonderful discussion so my question is that uh, it it's open to all the panel that today a big a bigger challenge before media is regarding the funding and the thing is that uh, the challenge is that if they go against the government that that government ads would not be coming so is there a way out that this yeah just identify yourself you okay my name is shivam shivam i am a student from delhi university okay yeah come please come Yeah. Good evening, everyone. You just press the key, sir. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. I heard a very detailed discussion about the all constructive negativism about the government. I have only one simple question to ask. I am proud of all you people. for giving your views but at the same time i wish from you to know that what should be done to improve the situation thank you uh, can you just identify yourself sir my name is sandeep singh bawa okay i am a ex chief engineer from a german company okay thank you thank you yeah sir uh, my name is nitin so sir after uh, hearing all these lectures so one terms came in my mind like narrative economics and i just just gone through one article also where if you want to become a powerful so you should have political and corporate power and i think the media have both like so there are many resignation like uh, network 18 everybody knows and ndtv so and there is large army troll army what madam is saying like if uh, one narrative is have to set up so uh, it will cover fired by large number of army of the trollers in the social media so they are controlling everything so here we are discussing only the problems so how we can counter and what is the solution for all that to create a counter narrative for that so because economics is involved in that and everybody need everybody because everybody work on incentives so how the counter narrative done without incentive or what the other part is doing in that that is my question okay yeah uh, good evening everyone my name is nilesh and i am from dr ambedkar university delhi and i am the student of sociology and uh, मैं आपके सामने मेरा एक ऑब्जर्वेशन रखना चाहता हूँ जो आज मॉर्निंग में जब मैं मेट्रो से आ रहा था तो जब हम एग्जिट करते हैं मेट्रो स्टेशन से तो काफ़ी चिल्ड्रंस होते हैं जो हमें पैसा या कुछ चीज़ें मांगते हैं और वो हमें दिखता भी है तो जैसे मैम ने जो कहा था कि ये जो इंडस्ट्री है मेन स्ट्रीम मीडिया ये किस तरीके से एक इंडस्ट्री ऑफ बिल्डिंग नरेशन है तो जैसे अगर हम किसी आम जगह पर मैं जब देखता हूँ तो कई बार जो मेन स्ट्रीम न्यूज़ चैनल्स है तो उसमें ये आता है कि हमने काफ़ी जगह पर इनविटेशंस भेजे हैं जो 22 को जो होने वाला है अयोध्या टेम्पल फंक्शंस तो ऐसे इनविटेशंस उन चिल्ड्रंस को क्यों नहीं आते कि आप एजुकेशन स्कूल में आ सके तो ये पहल वो मेन स्ट्रीम मीडिया से या फिर गवर्नमेंट से क्यों नहीं हो रहा है कि ऐसे चिल्ड्रंस जो कंट्री का आ, एक नया रूप दिखा सके थैंक यू वेरी मच Good evening. I am Naval Sehji. I am Shekhar's class fellow from school. I want to thank Suhas for organizing such interesting food for brain sessions. Now it's been a pleasure listening to all worthy media people here. But I just very simple thing to 
request them to deliberate on is media always angel number 2 how much is the terminology quid pro quo prevalent amongst the media thank you Rakesh, would you start, please? A couple of other questions that came, in fact, leads to my final observation that you talk, name, uh, talked about. Uh, keys to governance, uh, to me, as a student of history, is uh, on three counts in today's world, where an alternative world that we had in socialism has seen its uh, time in the Eastern Europe in many part, but we are living in a capitalist world. There's no bones about it. Now in capitalism, we need three basic, inst basic factors to develop a country, develop a society, whatever you want. One is capital, one is labor, and the third which combines these two are institutions. Now there was a time when there's a gentleman called Anwar Hoksa in Albania was supposed to be the, Albania was supposed to be the closest country. It, it closed itself in 1968. And the moment of closure was very interesting. Hoxha, uh, scared of uh, Stalin's, um, post-Stalin's um, coming over to Albania and do, doing what they did in Prague in 68, he told the Albanians that, you see, Albania was the poorest country in Europe at that point of time that um, we have become very rich, very prosperous, so prosperous that Europeans are becoming very envious of us and they all want to come and take our jobs. So he closed the country. And today, one of the tourist spots in Albania are the one lakh or a million bunkers that he built. Now, sometimes I fear that we might, if the media is not there, to look after what is the true nature of capital that we have today. What is the condition of labor that we have or going to produce through this new education policy and whatever what you have? And we don't have institutions which are based on modern scientific progressive nature. What is the condition? I hope if media is not there to question whether we are really very prosperous, whether we are really developed, whether we are becoming very rich, if we don't put these facts in front of us we become a close country with millions of concrete jungles. Thank you. So, um, broadly, I thought there were two sets of questions that were coming up. Um, one was uh, the question of sustainability. Is there a way out? Um, how to create counter-narratives also linked to that? Um, I think there is a need to think of different models of uh, running sustainable, but free, fair, and critical media. Um, so two or three come to my mind. One is crowdfunding, uh, as a lot of people say, you know, please contribute so that we can pay salaries and run good journalism. The other one is uh, CSR funding from uh, corporates. Uh, so there are uh, foundations which have been set up, which are supporting uh, such efforts. Third is uh, university funding. Universities can fund uh, independent critical media. I, in fact, work for 360info.org, which is entirely funded by universities. We are not dependent on ads at all. Uh, and we have a network of universities the world over who are supporting this. And we are in the Creative Commons. We don't charge anybody uh, anything for publishing what we give them, nor do we pay our contributors anything. And everybody is happy. So there are alternative models available. As long as you want a virtually free paper, which comes for one rupee, and you can sell it for uh, one and a half rupees to the Raddiwala, you will get garbage only. If you are willing to pay for news, uh, support independent journalism, then you might get critical media. So don't ask me, what can I do to create a counter-narrative? Ask yourself, what can you do to create a counter-narrative? What can you do to, to support uh, critical media? The, the fact is, Free newspapers, they are virtually free. They take about 20, 24 rupees to produce one Times of India on a Sunday, and you get it for 2 rupees 50 paisa. So as long as you are hooked on to this drug of free news uh, and make profit out of it by, or maybe not you, your servant uh, keeps the money from Raddi, 
you will get garbage you will get bad news you will get compliant media so you have to create an alternative and actively do so if you are not willing to do it then live with it lump it uh, the other thing is uh, when will things change things will change when politics changes but again i come 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 to the same point unless society changes nothing will change i just want to make one more point which bhasha bhasha is very optimistic about uh, journalism she says that a lot of people with excellent values and who are working very hard i'm sure she's right but my experience of journalism shows that there are two contradictory tendencies in newsrooms the dominant tendency with among the editors news editors chief subs is to support the dominant narrative of the government it may not be even of the government let's say society's dominant narrative is supported by them then there are young journalists who are, who are idealists they come into journalism thinking a lot of them may come for wrong reasons but i think a sizable number still comes motivated by idealism they think that journalism is politics by other means and you know their writing will change the world and they do those kind of stories and newspapers and media platforms use such young journalists and their reports from far off corners of the country to increase their legitimacy they say all right they support the government but look at this fantastic report from manipur this young reporter has done or look at this report from tamil nadu uh, somebody has done on the nuclear uh, 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 power plant and what's happening to people around it but what happens in the long run this young idealist journalist realizes pretty soon that to to climb up the greasy pole of success he has to follow uh, what what his bosses are doing because he has to become an editor otherwise you 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 just stay where you are so slowly all that idealism erodes and this huge bunch of people idealistic bunch of people becomes more pragmatic more worldly wise and starts sharing the same values as everybody else does so yes there there, there are idealists but their half life is very short i'm afraid thank you Uh, no, I uh, uh, taking from what Bharat has said. You see, if you uh, if you go and uh, talk to students in journalism school, uh, they already have this uh, this kind of a, a paradox emerging in their minds that uh, what we are taught here, and then what we when we go out is a different world. All that kind of ideal and the reality. You know what we began the whole discussion with. That, that they are facing that. There is no doubt of that. But then. you know i mean we we are in that period of transition where you have to face that and come to terms with it and how you react and how you go ahead that's the big question on each conscience of a future journalist now uh, uh, nr yeah i think they uh, as varad uh, said it's there are two trends of questions about the funding yes uh, but i disagree with what the saying that uh, today print newspaper yes we are paying 5 rupees 550 or 6 6 rupees for the print uh, for a sunday times of india but today increasingly the readership is moving away from the print newspaper to the digital platform and digital platform uh, absolutely costs much 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 less so it's it's not something that uh, uh, that if the media houses have the will power they will not be able to sustain it it's certainly they of course media houses as i said in my lecture that there are two kinds of media houses one which is consciously part of the dominant narrative so that they will get the maximum benefit i mean that's something which uh, which i i remember i worked in um, in in uh, india tv for a while and the the, the editor used to say that um, today monty we will become the number one we will today peddle the narrative that we will become number one every day he would tell the bunch of editors that this is what we need to do and obviously that's that's the their agent they consciously wanted to be part of that dominant narrative but wherever there is a will and there would be alternative narratives that can be presented that is very much possible and i think where where the narrative is from comes from the top i ajapt was uh, bharat said that yes most people have consciously chosen to lie low 
to become servile because that's the easier way to get into the good books of the government. Nobody wants to be in the bad book of the government. But that's why the courage of conviction necessary. I do not think that's so much the question of uh, political economy. Yes, political economy of mass media, which uh, Chomsky talked about. But today, in the with the digital platform, I think uh, the really conscious, consensus owners can be able to provide an alternative. And of course, for the individuals like us, the social media provides a very, very effective platform. We all use that platform to spread. Of course, we will not match with the corporate media, but nevertheless, we are able to do it. And that's the reason what I say that uh, we have to, both at individual level and organization level, have to keep up that spirit, not to give in. Bhasa said about uh, some people who are still there, who are, yes, I see in the, in the press of India, we have uh, certain journalists who are from Kashmir who continue to have that spirit of fight and continue to do so. And we need to lend support to them. And possibly as narrative will change. And I, I am very hopeful this dominant narrative that is there today will change possibly in 2024 itself. दो तीन चीजें जो बहुत जरूरी हैं और जो आ, सवाल भी अच्छे थे कि हम जिंदा कैसे रहेंगे सस्टेन कैसे करेंगे और आ, क्या मॉडल होगा किस तरह से कहां से पैसा आएगा कैसे ये मीडिया या ये आवाज मुझे लगता है एक चीज जो कन्विक्शन की आ, है अगर वो आ, ये लगता है कि हमें कहना है बोलना है लिखना है फिल्म बनानी है वीडियोस बनाने हैं और उसके लिए रास्ता निकालना है मुझे लगता है कि वो एक पानी की तरह है कि अगर हम दिमाग में है कि पानी गिरेगा तो अपना रास्ता निकालेगा रास्ता बहुत मुश्किल है मुझे लगता है यहां पे जितने लोग हैं हम सब अपने दिल से जानते हैं कि रास्ता कितना मुश्किल है यह कहना कि मैं नॉनवेज खाती हूं या न, मैं करवा चौथ नहीं करती हूं भी क्राइम होता जा रहा है धीरे-धीरे है ना तो इस दौर में भी हम अगर सच को सच की तरह बोले और ये मान के चले कि सच पहुंच रहा है बात पहुंच रही है क्योंकि मुझे क्योंकि आ, इतने साल में जब भी मैं ग्राउंड रिपोर्ट्स करती हूं तो मुझे सबसे ज्यादा एनर्जी मिलती है और ये लगता है कि नहीं लोग सुनने वाले हैं लोग आप जो कह रहे हैं लिख रहे हैं वो पहुंचता है कहीं जाया नहीं जाता है इसलिए मैं ये कह रही हूं क्योंकि एक माहौल ये बनाया जा रहा है कि जो लोग लिख पढ़ सकते हैं बोल सकते हैं उनके दिमाग में ये खौफ तारी हो जाए या फियर आ जाए कि बोलना मना है सेल्फ सेंसरशिप से बचना मुझे लगता है आज के दौर में सबसे ज्यादा जरूरी है स्टेट आप तक पहुंचे ना पहुंचे हमें ये खौफ है कि अगर हमने कहा तो क्या होगा इसलिए हम कहने से बचते हैं या गलत कुछ हो रहा है तो बोलने से बचते हैं और भरत जी बात सही है कि मैं ऑप्टिमिस्टिक हूं क्योंकि मुझे लगता है कि जिंदा तो रहना ही है और काम तो करना ही है और ऐसे लोग वाकई मिलते हैं ये और इसमें एज गैप भी मुझे नहीं दिखाई देता है चाहे वो जन संदेश निकलता रहा हो जन मोर्चा निकलता रहा हो फैजाबाद से बहुत पुराने मॉडल का या किसान आंदोलन के दौरान एक छोटा सा अखबार निकलने वाली टीम को मैंने देखा छोटे छोटे चैनल्स लेकिन जिंदा रहने के लिए जो एक फाइट है आ, मुझे लगता है कि वो अगर मीडिया कर्मी में हो और मीडिया कर्मी उठा भी रहे हैं तमाम बड़े बड़े कॉर्पोरेट चैनल से कुछ लोग निकाले जाने के बाद कुछ लोग निकालने के बाद जो ऑप्शंस ले रहे हैं वो एक अल्टरनेटिव नरेशन किस तरह से बिल्ड हो पाए और सबसे बड़ी बात मुझे लगता है कि ये जो कड़ियाँ हैं आपने जो कहा भरत जी ने जो कहा जो बाकी लोग कह रहे हैं उनका जो जुड़ना है वो नहीं हो रहा एक आइसोलेशन जो ग्लोबलाइजेशन का सबसे तगड़ा चीज है कि आप सब लोग अपने अपने सेफ जोन्स में हैं और सबको लगता है कि हमारी बारी तो नहीं आई इनके घर पुलिस आ गई मेरे घर नहीं आई उन्होंने लिखा था इसलिए हो गया उन्होंने मीट खाया था अखलाक ने खाया था इसलिए हो गया हाथरस की बेटी अपनी दोस्त के साथ बात कर रही थी इसलिए हो गया या इस तरह की जनरेशन ये बहुत जरूरी है कि इन सारे जो गेटोज बन गए हैं इनको हम कैसे ब्रेक कर पाए और निश्चित तौर पर सरवाइव करने के लिए जो फंडिंग है 
उसके बहुत ऑप्शन हैं कॉरपोरेट uh, फंडिंग कितनी हो पाएगी ये लोग uh, जो बड़े जनता है वो समझा सकते हैं लेकिन मुझे लगता है कि तरीके तो खोजने होंगे और लोग तरीके खोज रहे हैं ये एक अच्छी बात मुझे लगती है कि पीपल आर फाइंडिंग वेज टू सरवाइव वी हैव टू सरवाइव दैट शुड बी द रूल आई थिंक भरत वॉन्ट्स टू कम इन ऑन दैट क्वेश्चन ऑफ मीडिया एंजल एंड ट्विटरो कि बिल्कुल सही बात है कि एक लगातार स्ट्रगल चलती रहती है आ, स्टेट और जर्नलिस्ट के बीच में आ, और जो लोग मुख्य धारा की मीडिया से अलग हो चुके हैं वो नए नए तरीके ढूंढ रहे हैं कितना सस्टेनेबल है वो देखना पड़ेगा वो नया नैरेटिव भी तैयार कर रहे हैं लेकिन उसी तरीके से नए हथियार भी तैयार हो रहे हैं उनको कंट्रोल करने के लिए ब्रॉडकास्ट बिल्कुल आ गया है तो ये ये तो लगातार लड़ाई है लेकिन ये मार्जिन्स uh, पे लोग हैं इनको ढूंढना पड़ता है कि ये कहाँ पे हैं कहाँ पे आपको एक दूसरी किस्म की पत्रकारिता मिल रही है वो करने के लिए लोग तैयार हैं ही नहीं सब लोग चाहते हैं पकी पकाई खिचड़ी उनके सामने परोस दी जाए लेकिन स्वादिष्ट होनी चाहिए खराब नहीं होनी चाहिए और मुफ्त में भी होनी चाहिए तो वो वो ही बात मैं कह रहा था एज फार एज योर क्वेश्चन इज कंसर्न सर आर मीडिया प्रैक्टिशनर जर्नलिस्ट एंजल्स ऑफकोर्स नॉट The general impression is that a journalist can be bought for two packs of whiskey. Don't we know it? We all know it. Uh, but who is an angel? Is the MP who spends thirty uh, to fifty crores on his election is he an angel? Is the man who uses corporate aircraft as taxis is he an angel? And therefore, we uh, give him the top position. Is the corporate leader who misuses his connections to the government to change economic policies and uh, rules and regulations so that his business can thrive is he an angel? Who is an angel? so i think this question is a rhetorical question the question we should be asking is how do we become good citizens what what should i be as a journalist what is my role okay, so the focus on constitutionality um, uh, will lead us to uh, uh, the kind of democracy we want not these uh, rhetorical questions is he an angel is he the devil uh, is he in between you know so these are they sound very interesting these questions but it's pointless engaging with them the question is how can i be a good journalist how can i be a good uh, politician representative of the people how can i be a responsible corporate leader how can i be a good prime minister uh, how can i set an example to people of this country to my children to the future generations but i'm saying the the thinking around uh, citizenship and role of the citizen in in a democracy i think to me that is crucial you may be an angel you may not be an angel but if you are a good citizen that's good enough for me yeah i think we've had a, a, a very interesting and a, a, a long session but i i would uh, i mean in my own uh, uh, i'm a die hard optimist and i i feel that uh, to bring in gandhi at this stage that uh, as hitler and mussolini you know did not last long and uh, they, they i mean never ne nothing like that lasts forever so they they will be uh, i mean they'll be um, to use a cliche they'll be a new dawn and we have to live and survive to that day so that uh, we can continue this struggle thank you very much thank you for being so patient thank you